Unit 19. Bus routes. Listening. Listen to a conversation on the same topic and take notes. It looks as though the school's going to start those new bus routes pretty soon. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to them. I'm not. They're probably going to increase the noise level on campus. That's true, but this is a big campus and there aren't many buses on campus now. We really could use some more buses so that we can get to places on campus a lot quicker. Right now, I've got to walk about 15 minutes to get to each class. Buses will cut down on that time considerably. All right, but the bus routes won't be in effect during the evening. What about all of the night school students who won't get to make use of the program? That's not fair, is it? Well, it's unfortunate, but the large majority of the students here take classes during the day. Since the school doesn't have unlimited funds, it should take care of the largest number of students. That means the day students should come first. Okay, I guess that I see your points. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The topic of the notice is some bus route changes that the school will be making on its campus. The woman supports these changes for a couple of reasons. According to the woman, there are not enough buses on campus. She states that she needs 15 minutes to walk to her classes. However, once she is able to take a bus, she will be able to get to her classes much faster than she is currently. While the man points out that the night school students will not benefit from these bus route changes, the woman counters by saying that the school doesn't have an unlimited amount of money. In the woman's mind, the school must take care of the day students first because they make up a majority of the student body. Unit 20. Library construction. Listening. Listen to a conversation on the same topic and take notes. It seems they're finally putting a cafe in the library's basement. Yeah, I heard. I can't understand why they're doing such a thing. Really? Why do you say that? Well, I heard it's only going to sell junk food like donuts, chips, and candy bars. You know, stuff like that. What? No fruits or healthy alternatives? Nope, just junk food, which is terrible for people and really unhealthy. The cafe should at least offer some good food and drinks, but it won't. That's not good. No, it isn't. Also, it's simply too close. Well, it's inside the library. How do you think that will affect students? Well, it'll give them an easy excuse to procrastinate. They'll go down there and hang out with their friends instead of focusing on their schoolwork. At least having to go off campus keeps more students in the library because the shops are far away. I see your point. Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I think this new cafe in the library isn't such a good idea. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. According to the announcement, a new cafe is opening in the library's basement. The male student dislikes this idea of including a student cafe inside the library. First of all, he says that the cafe will only be selling snacks and junk food like donuts, chips, and candy bars. He claims that junk food is bad for people and is too unhealthy. The second reason he gives is that because of its location, many students will start hanging out at the cafe. He feels this will cause students to procrastinate and stop focusing on their studies. In his opinion, to get students to study, it's better to have restaurants far away from the library instead of actually inside of it. This will convince students to stay in the library and study instead of going out to eat. Unit 21 Student Affairs Listening Listen to a conversation on the same topic and take notes. Hey, this is a spectacular idea. The school is moving elections for student representatives to September. That'll let freshmen be more involved in the elections. Yeah, maybe. But you know what? Lots of students are busy at the beginning of the year. They've got to fix their schedules and get used to their roommates and stuff. So? Well, I'm just saying that many students might not bother to vote if the elections are held too early in the school year. I probably won't vote if I'm occupied with getting used to starting school again. Okay, you have a point. But what about the freshmen? 
Don't you think it's great that they'll get involved in the election process? Hmm. It's fine that they'll get to vote, but they don't really know anything about the important issues on campus. So how can they make good decisions without knowing all the facts? And they won't know much about the candidates either. They'll be voting, but they won't have information to go with. Well, I guess I see your points. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The man feels negatively toward the Student Activities Office's decision to move the date of the student representative elections from May to September. He gives two reasons for his negative feelings. First, he mentions that in September, students are still getting used to their schedules, their roommates, and simply being back at school. So, many students, including the student himself, might not vote if they're too busy with back-to-school activities. Second of all, he acknowledges that while it's nice that freshmen may now vote in the elections, they will not know enough about either the important campus issues or the candidates themselves. He states that they won't know all of the necessary facts before they vote. Because of this lack of knowledge, they won't be able to make educated decisions on who to vote for. How to Master Skills for the TOEFL IBT Speaking Intermediate Chapter 4 Reading and Lecture Sample IBT Question Listen to a lecture on the same topic. Now, most of you have probably heard about the lungfish and know that it is a species of fish that is actually capable of breathing air, hence the name lungfish. Well, that capability is integral to the survival of lungfish that live in Africa and South America. Here, let me tell you about what they do. Well, as you know, various places in Africa and South America have both rainy and dry seasons. During the dry season, the pools of water where the lungfish live often simply evaporate from the heat. So, what do the lungfish do in order to survive? Well, they dig holes deep in the ground and cover themselves in slime and mud. This helps keep them cool in the heat. After that, they enter a period of dormancy. This slows down their body functions considerably. For example, their hearts might beat only three times a minute. Incredible, huh? and they might only breathe twice an hour. Simply put, they engage in almost no physical activity. They remain in this state for as long as the dry season lasts. Once the rain starts falling and the water returns, the lungfish can return to their normal existence of living in the water. Sample Response In his lecture, the professor focuses on the lungfish a species of fish in Africa and South America that can breathe air. When the dry season comes and its pools of water evaporate, the lungfish has to dig a deep hole in the ground to live in. It then covers itself with dirt and slime and promptly enters a period of dormancy. Dormancy is a time when an animal ceases developing and slows down its bodily functions. This is exactly what the lungfish does. It doesn't move, it slows down its heart rate, and it breathes only two times an hour. Because it is lying dormant, it doesn't need any physical nourishment. This allows the lungfish to survive until the rains come back and create more pools of water for it to live in. Unit 22 Biology 1 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. We've talked about some of the animals in Africa and the roles they play in their environments, but let me tell you about the most important one. Are you ready? It's 
the elephant. Really, <laughs> I'm serious. Actually, the elephant is a keystone species in its part of Africa. Here, let me explain it. First, elephants have prodigious appetites. Do you know how much they eat daily? They chow down about 500 pounds of vegetation. Wow! Thanks to elephants, the areas in which they live don't get overrun with plants. Why is this important? Well, if elephants weren't there, their habitat would be filled with vegetation, which would cause most other animal species either to migrate or simply become extinct. They wouldn't be able to handle the resulting new environment. Since they eat lots, elephants also defecate a lot. Because elephants are somewhat nomadic, they spread nutrients for the soil to absorb, and through their waste, they essentially plant seeds, which will grow up to be plants that other animals can feed upon. Clearly then, elephants are crucial to their environment. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The professor begins by telling the students that the keystone species in Africa is the elephant. He states that a keystone species is defined as an animal that has an incredibly large effect on its environment. While the most common keystone species are predators, there are other ways in which animals can serve as a keystone species. This is the case of the elephant. To begin with, elephants eat around 500 pounds of vegetation a day. This keeps the forest from expanding too much something which would inconvenience other animals to the point that they would either migrate from the region or merely die off. Also, when elephants wander and defecate, they enrich the soil and plant seeds that will become other plants and trees. Animals can then use these new plants as food sources. Unit 23 Sociology 1 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. So, those are some of the roles you might find yourself playing at various times in your life. But I'm sure some of you are wondering what happens when there is a situation that arises which could be handled in uh, different ways, depending upon which role you decide to act out. Understand what I mean? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. I know many of you have part-time jobs. Well. Have there ever been cases where your job has conflicted with school? Probably. For example, assume that a student has a part-time job at a restaurant. His boss tells him to come to work at 3 the next day, but the student has class at that time. So, which role does he play? That of the student or employee? He's conflicted. His choice will be determined by which role he chooses for himself. Here's another example. Perhaps one of my colleagues lives close by the school, which is very convenient since he has a wife and, oh, two young children. Suddenly, he gets a better job offer from a university 30 miles away. He could vastly improve his career prospects by taking the job, but he'd be home less often. He's got a role conflict, right? Does he choose the role of father or employee? Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The professor describes two situations. The first involves a student whose boss wants him to work at the same time he should attend class. The student must choose either to attend class or go to his job. The second situation involves a professor with a wife and young children. If he takes a new job, he will improve his career, but will not be able to spend much time with his family. These are both examples of role conflict. In role conflict, depending upon which role the person chooses, the response to a situation will be different. In these two instances, the reactions will be opposites. The student can work or not work, depending upon his choice of roles, and the professor can take or leave the job, depending upon the role he takes. Unit 24 Psychology 1 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. Now, I know most of you probably think that impression management doesn't play a major role in our lives. But if you think that, you're definitely wrong. As a matter of fact, we use impression management all the time, 
even if we aren't consciously aware of doing so. Here are some examples. Your class presentations begin next week, right? So what are you planning to wear to them? Surely not the clothes you're wearing now. If you showed up in a t-shirt, shorts, and uh, sandals, do you think I'd be impressed? Hardly. Instead, you're all likely to dress up in formal clothes like suits to try to impress me. Why? Well, you want me to take you seriously, so you're dressing the part. You're managing my impression of you. Let me give you a personal example. I had to give the dean a ride home one night. I knew I was going to have to do it, so the night before, I made sure to wash my car and threw out all the garbage in the back of my car. I even had a couple of classical music CDs in the car because I knew that's the kind of music the dean likes. Why did I do this? Just to make a good impression. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. In the course of the lecture, the professor provides two instances in which people were conscious of the image they were projecting. She first mentioned the students' upcoming class presentations. She told them that if they wore casual clothes like t-shirts and shorts, she wouldn't take them seriously. Instead, they needed to wear formal clothes to give her a more favorable impression of them. Likewise, she cited a personal example. Before she drove the dean home one night, she cleaned her car and prepared some classical music to impress him. Both instances are related to impression management in that the people, the students, and the professor are trying to show themselves in the best possible light to create a positive impression. They are also preventing the person from finding out anything negative about them, another important aspect of impression management. Unit 25 Biology 2 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. As we know, species increase at different rates. Of course, rapid rates of increase can have tremendous effects on their environments and how nature handles these increases. Let me cite two examples which may seem different but are actually connected. Let me discuss the pine tree first. This is one of the faster-growing tree species. In fact, it grows so rapidly that it can literally take over entire forests. In some cases, it has pushed out other tree species especially because it can grow in practically any climate and any kind of soil. So, what limits its population? Well, there are diseases that kill them and humans chop them down, but it's mostly fire that burns them down and slows their growth. Forest fires occur naturally, and they regularly limit pine trees' growth lest they take over entire forests. Now let's think about deer. Well, the deer population can increase by 30% in any year. So. What keeps their numbers from raging out of control? Well, as the deer population increases, so does that of predators like wolves. There are more deer to eat, so the wolves' numbers increase. Of course, as the deer population decreases, so too does the wolf population. These are just a couple of ways that nature controls the populations of her species. Compare Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. During his lecture, the professor mentions excessive and rapid population growth by both pine trees and deer. According to the professor, pine trees can survive almost anywhere in any climate and soil, and they also grow very rapidly, which is something that causes them to take over forests. Also, the professor mentions that deer can increase their numbers by 30% in a single year. This can also cause overpopulation problems for forests. The reading states that population growth can be controlled by many different factors, which thereby keep the balance of nature secure. Fire, caused by nature, helps to limit the number of pine trees, while wolves and other predators can proliferate, thereby killing and eating the deer. These are just two methods nature uses to control the rapid population growth of various species. Unit 26. Philosophy. Listening. Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. Let me give you an example of the dangers of thinking too much. Here's a situation. 
You wake up and look out your window to see the tree in front of your house is burning. After extinguishing the fire, you start thinking about how it started. You arrive at two conclusions. First, someone went to your house and set the tree on fire. Okay, let's run down this line of reasoning. Why did he do it? Does someone dislike you that much? I hope not. <laughs> also, only the top half of the tree caught fire. So the person must have climbed up the tree and started the fire, or else climbed up a ladder to start the fire at the top of the tree. And how did he manage to get away with no one seeing him on that busy street you live on? Now you arrive at a second conclusion. There was a thunderstorm with lots of lightning last night. Lightning must have struck the tree and started the fire. It's as simple as that. Now, which of these propositions is more logical? I'd say it's the simplest one. The first has too many variables and is highly unlikely. When you get down to it, the simplest solution tends also to be the best one. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The professor tells the class about an incident where a person wakes up to see a tree burning in his yard. He arrives at two conclusions about the fire. The first is that someone disliked the homeowner very much, so he went to the house, climbed the tree, started the fire, and escaped unnoticed. The second is that, since there was a thunderstorm the previous night, a bolt of lightning must have struck the tree and started the fire. The reading passage describes Occam's razor, a principle that basically states that the simplest solution is the best. This is how the professor arrives at the decision that the second proposal is correct. There are too many variables and possibilities in the first conclusion, so by using Occam's razor, he knows it was an impossible scenario, making the second solution right. Unit 27 Sociology 2 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. Let's say that two bad car accidents occur in the same place. However, one accident occurs in the morning when many people are commuting to work, and the other one occurs at night when there are few people on the road. Now, for which accident are people more likely to stop and render assistance to the injured, the morning or night accident? Anyone? Well, surprisingly enough, statistics show that people in the uh, night accident are more likely to receive assistance from a passing motorist. Let me explain why. It's called diffusion of responsibility. Simply put, in the morning there are many cars going by. While some people may want to stop, they also have other obligations like, uh, getting to work. Since there are many other drivers, they convince themselves that someone else will stop and help the injured. Of course, in most cases, no one stops because everyone has passed on the responsibility to other passers-by. For the night accident, though, there are, well, fewer people on the road. Therefore, a passing motorist may experience a stronger feeling of responsibility, since the likelihood of someone else coming by is low. Again, statistics show that passing motorists on little-traveled roads are much more likely to stop, and that is how diffusion of responsibility works. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The subject of the talk is two accidents that occur in the same location. However, one accident happens during the day and the other happens late at night. According to the professor's statistics, the people injured at night are more likely to receive help than those injured during the day. This fact is strongly related to the diffusion of responsibility. This is the concept that absolves people from personal responsibility when they're in a large group situations. In the morning accident, there are numerous motorists passing by. Therefore, no one feels a sense of individual responsibility. These people all expect or hope that someone else will stop to help. But at night, there are fewer people driving, so there is no diffusion of responsibility. A passing driver will stop to help because he feels personally responsible for rendering assistance. Unit 28 Psychology 2 Listening Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes.
I'm sure everyone has purchased something in the past and later felt bad about buying it. The reason for that feeling is buyer's remorse, and people often experience two separate reactions. Here's a personal example that should help explain this phenomenon. Two weeks ago, I purchased a really expensive car. I just got promoted and felt like splurging, so I went and got a car that, quite frankly, cost way too much. Anyway, it felt good driving it for a few days, <sighs> but after a while I started feeling bad. I thought that the car was um, too expensive and didn't fit me. My first impulse was to return the car. That's the onset of buyer's remorse. So I called the dealer who sold me the car and told him the truth. And you know what he did? He kept telling me I had made the right decision. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's his job. <laughs> but he pointed out a lot of things I hadn't thought of. He told me how it was the right vehicle for my family and me, and he promised to keep in touch to check up on me and make sure that the car is running well. So, yeah, he really did convince me to keep it. That's how I beat buyer's remorse. Compare Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The professor gives a personal example of how he purchased an expensive automobile after getting promoted. While he couldn't afford it, he still bought the vehicle and loved driving it. However, he began feeling somewhat bad, thinking that it had cost too much and that it didn't really fit him. His mood changed from good to bad. This is a classic instance of buyer's remorse. This often occurs sometime after a person buys something large or expensive which mirrors the professor's case. Typically, the person will either attempt to return the item or convince himself that he should keep it. Again, this is what the professor did. At first, he wanted to return the car, but after talking it over with the dealer, he became convinced that he should actually keep it. How to Master Skills for the TOEFL IBT Speaking Intermediate Chapter 5 Conversation Sample IBT Question Listen to a conversation between two students. I can't believe what just happened. What's the matter? Did you lose something? Well, I may have lost my financial aid. The deadline to apply for financial aid from the university was yesterday, but I was out of town and didn't get my application in. I might have to drop out of school now. Well, why don't you just go down to the financial aid office and explain to them what happened? I'm sure they'll accept your application, and then you'll be able to get money for your classes and books. I don't know. I had a friend who forgot and submitted his application late, but they weren't very understanding of his situation. They might do the same thing to me. Okay. In that case, why don't you just ask your parents to help pay for your tuition? I'm sure that they'd either give you the money or loan it to you. Yeah, they do have the money, but my parents are planning on taking a trip to Europe this summer. If they lend me the money, they won't be able to go on that trip, and they've been planning it for almost a year now. Sample Response The male student's problem is that he missed the deadline to apply for financial aid and may have to quit attending school if he loses his financial support. In my opinion, the best solution to his problem is for him to go to the financial aid office and explain his situation. First, he was out of town when the deadline passed. The university should accept that as a legitimate excuse and allow him to submit his application one day late. Furthermore, while the man could ask his parents for money, that would interrupt their vacation plans. 
Instead, he should try to get the university to provide him with a scholarship that would pay the costs of his tuition and books. This is much better than asking for money he'd have to pay back later. Unit 29 Student Life 1 Listening Listen to a conversation and take notes. Wow, the kitchen in your dormitory is really messy. Well, we thought we had it taken care of, but now we're back to square one. Oh, you tried the weekly schedule with your roommate? We tried it for about three days, but nobody followed it. We are all too absent-minded. Well, why don't you hire someone to clean it up for you every week? Just pay someone to give it a thorough cleaning. Then you won't have to worry about it. Actually, we thought of that. We called up some cleaning services, but they charge pretty high prices. We'd have trouble being able to afford it. What else could you do then? Well, I guess we could create a kind of sign-in board. Whenever someone uses the kitchen, he has to sign in. Then, if he doesn't clean up after himself, we'll know who made the mess. That way nobody will have to clean up someone else's mess all the time. That might work, but what if someone doesn't sign in or forgets? Then you'll be accusing each other of messing it up all over again. That's true, but we'd better decide something soon, though. The kitchen is a wreck. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The man's problem is that the kitchen in his dormitory is always very messy, yet he and his roommates never bother to clean it. In my opinion, the student and his roommate should hire someone to come to clean it up on a regular basis. First, by hiring a cleaning person, they would never have to worry about doing the cleaning themselves. Although it will be expensive if the man and his roommate split the cost, hiring a cleaning person should be affordable. Second of all, a person coming to clean the kitchen would ensure that they always have a hygienic place in which to cook. This is important since a dirty kitchen can attract bugs and also smell bad. However, by having it cleaned regularly, they wouldn't have to worry about either of those problems. Unit 30 Internships Listening Listen to a conversation and take notes. Hey, I heard you got that internship on the marine research team at that company. Congratulations! Thanks a lot. Actually, it's giving me a little bit of stress at the moment. Really? What's the problem? Well, it's like this. The job is awesome, but the pay isn't enough. It won't even cover my tuition for the semester. I know that if I ask for more money, they'll just replace me with someone who will work for less. Oh, that's quite a dilemma. How about going to the company to discuss your situation? They'll probably give you the extra money you need to pay your tuition. Do you know how many people applied for the internship? It would probably be easier for them to take on someone else. Then why don't you just get a part-time job? That way you could make up the difference and pay for your tuition. I've thought about that, but the internship is very demanding. It's practically a full-time position. I'll barely have enough time to study for my classes. I'm not sure I can fit a part-time job into my full schedule. Yeah, this really is a complex situation, isn't it? Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The female student's complaint is that the internship she just got hired for pays so little money that she won't even be able to cover her tuition with the money she earns. I agree with the man's suggestion that she find a part-time job. Working part-time will get her the money she requires to pay for her tuition. She needs the extra money, so she really has no choice but to work no matter how busy it makes her. In addition, if she finds a part-time job, she'll be able to keep her internship. The woman says there were many applicants for it, so it will most likely provide her with valuable working experience. When she applies for jobs or to graduate schools, her experience will benefit her greatly, so she needs to work to keep her internship. Unit 31 Part-time jobs Listening. Listen to a conversation and take notes. Are you on your way to class? 
No, actually I'm going to meet my research advisor to help her with some work. If you could call it that. What do you mean by that? Well, I never do any research for her. She just has me type things up she's already researched, or asks me to make photocopies of papers and documents. That doesn't sound like research to me. Why don't you quit and find another research position? Then you'd be able to do research and not just be a secretary. Well, I really would like to, but it wouldn't look good on my resume if I just abandoned this professor halfway through her project. Right. Okay. Then why don't you complain a bit to the professor? She will probably involve you more in her work if she knows how you feel. I've considered doing that too, but I really feel bad about bothering her with my own petty issues. I mean, she is really busy and under a lot of pressure because of her deadlines. I see. Well, obviously you're not content with the work. You'd better do something about it soon. You're right. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The female student has a problem in that she's supposed to be conducting research for a professor, but the professor has her doing secretarial jobs like making photocopies. The man encourages the woman to quit her current job and find a different one, and I strongly feel that this is the best solution. The woman isn't interested in being a secretary. By finding a new job, she could get some experience conducting research, which is what she really wants to do. Additionally, doing research at another job would make the woman happier. The woman is obviously not pleased with her current situation, and she doesn't want to bother the professor with her complaints. Since the professor is unlikely to change on her own, her best option is to quit her current job and find work elsewhere. Unit 32 Transportation Listening Listen to a conversation and take notes. What happened to you? I went skydiving with my boyfriend last weekend and fractured my ankle. Skydiving? Wow! I have to wear this cast for six weeks, and I just started a teaching job all the way downtown. I can't drive my car because of this, so I'm not sure how I'm going to get there and back every day. A cab would be way too expensive. What are you going to do then? I could ask Sean for a ride every day. He works downtown. I'd save money and get there and back on time. That's not a bad idea, but is it okay to ask him such a big favor? Plus, he gets off work early in the afternoon, so he might be stuck waiting around for you. Oh, right. Well, I could also call the school and see if there's a teacher near me who can give me a lift. Another teacher would be very reliable. That's a pretty good idea, but you just got hired, right? You don't want to seem like a nuisance. The school might not get a good impression of you. Yeah, I see your point. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. What happened to the woman is that she broke her ankle skydiving, so her leg's in a cast. Now she can't drive her car, so she needs to find another way to get to her new job downtown. I agree with the man's suggestion that she ask the school if any teachers in her neighborhood could give her a ride to work. To begin with, this would be the most convenient way to get to work. A teacher living in her neighborhood probably wouldn't mind giving her a ride since they're both starting and finishing work at the same time. Also, accidents happen, so the school should understand the woman's situation and not consider her request a bother. Since the woman will only need help for six weeks, the school shouldn't have a problem assisting her. Unit 33 Campus Tours Listening. Listen to a conversation and take notes. What's the hurry? Oh, I'm going to pick up my cousin at the airport. She'll be here for the weekend. That sounds nice. Not really. I mean, it is, but I've got a minor problem. She wants to go to school here and major in art. I'd love to give her a campus tour myself, but I've got to work all day Saturday. Oh, I see your problem. Why don't you just have her take the tour offered by the university? You can go to work, and she can still learn all about the university and its different programs. That's a possibility, but the tour is too general. 
I was hoping to show her around the art department personally to give her some more detailed information. I see. Then, well, why don't you just show her around campus yourself on Sunday? You can take all the time you need to explain everything to her. Yes, I suppose I could do that, but the problem is I've already made arrangements with my friends to go to a football game. I'll be there all day long. I can't let my friends down, can I? Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The man's problem is that his cousin is coming to town on the weekend. She wants to look at the school, but the man is going to be busy on both Saturday and Sunday. In my opinion, the man's best option is to cancel his Sunday plans and show his cousin around campus on Sunday. I support this decision because touring the campus together on Sunday would give them lots of time to look at the campus in detail. The university tour is too general and won't show everything, and his cousin would like to look at the art department in depth. In addition, the man should put family ahead of his own personal pleasure. Even though he already has plans, his friends will understand if he cancels them to help his cousin out. Unit 34 Student Life 2 Listening Listen to a conversation and take notes. What's the matter with you? It's my roommate. She never cleans up after herself. There's still a plate of spaghetti that she made last week sitting on the coffee table. That's pretty gross. Tell me about it. I've talked to her about it thousands of times, and she always promises to clean up after herself, but she's all talk. You should go to the housing office and file a complaint against her. Then she'll have to start cleaning or she could get kicked out of the dorm. You have the right to live in a clean place. Yeah, but I'd hate for her to get kicked out. I'm not sure she can afford off-campus housing. Well, what else could you do? I hate to offer this as a solution because it isn't my fault. But I could just find a new place and live by myself. Being alone would let me live in a clean, stress-free environment. That's true, but you'd lose your security deposit for the dorm and moving would be expensive. Plus, she is the one causing all of the problems. It should be her who moves. Well, I have to do something soon. I can't continue living like this. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The issue that the woman is dealing with is that her roommate is messy and never cleans up after herself, which has made her dorm room dirty and given the woman lots of stress. Clearly, the better suggestion the man makes is for the woman to file a complaint about her roommate with the housing office. If her roommate won't voluntarily clean up after herself, she should be made to do so. When you live with another person, you're obliged to be respectful of that person. And cleaning is one way to show respect. Second of all, the woman has a right to live in a clean environment that's free from stress. When you live in a dorm, you agree to follow its standards. So the woman's roommate should either start cleaning or find another place to live. Unit 35 Makeup Exams Listening. Listen to a conversation and take notes. Jane, I've got a problem, and I was hoping you could give me some advice. Sure, go ahead. You know, I've got that big biology test in two hours, right? Well, unfortunately, my car broke down yesterday while I was driving, so by the time I got it fixed, I had to go to bed and couldn't study for it. That doesn't sound good. So what are you going to do? Well. I could simply take the makeup exam later this week. Then I could study more. The professor is permitting all the students who went on the field trip on Sunday to take the test this Friday. That sounds good. Go for it. But I, uh, didn't go on the field trip. So I'm not sure if Professor Taylor will allow me to take the test late. Okay, that's not good. Well, why don't you just take the test today? You've attended every class, so you should be familiar with the material. That's true, but I really needed an A in this class. If I don't get one, I might not make the dean's list this semester. That's what I'm shooting for. Well, you'd better do something fast.
Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The problem is that the man has an exam in two hours but couldn't study for it the night before since his car broke down and he had to get it fixed. During the conversation, the woman tells the man to take his biology test this day. I agree with her. First, she reasons that he's attended all of the classes so he knows the material. He's obviously a good student since he's trying to make the dean's list, so he should be smart enough to do well on the test. Furthermore, the man should do the right thing and take the test on the proper day. He doesn't qualify to take the makeup exam since he didn't go on the field trip. He should therefore take personal responsibility for his car breaking down and simply take the exam that day. How to Master Skills for the TOEFL IBT Speaking Intermediate Chapter 6 Lecture Sample IBT Question Listen to a lecture and take notes. Now, I'd like to talk about how to improve your acting, especially since you're going to be putting on a performance soon in which you'll need good acting to get a, well, a good grade. So, when you're acting, you need to become that character. It's uh, imperative for you to think and feel just like that character would. These acts can make your character genuine and believable. For example, Say you're going to play the title role of Shakespeare's play Henry VIII. Well, if you're going to be a king, then you'll have to act like one. You have to carry yourself like one. You think, no, you know that you're better than the rest of the people on stage. Henry was a proud man, convinced that his actions were right. You actually need to feel that kind of confidence in order to be a convincing king. If you can't do that, well, then you're not going to be believable. The audience will recognize that, and your performance and the overall play will suffer. Let me give you another example. Imagine you're going to play the role of Hamlet from Shakespeare's masterpiece. Well, it's a complicated role since, remember, Hamlet keeps seeing the ghost of his murdered father, and he is pretending to be insane. So you've got to feel like Hamlet. How are you going to act? You've got to appear to be insane during some scenes, yet appear sane in others. You've simply got to become Hamlet in this role. Feel what he feels. Think what he thinks. Become him. And you'll have mastered the role and become a real actor. Sample response The professor provides a couple of examples of how an actor can become more convincing to the audience when playing various roles. He uses two different examples from Shakespeare in his lecture. First, he discusses Henry VIII from the play with the same name. He declares that an actor must act completely like a king in order to get that role right. Since Henry was very proud and confident, an actor must convey those same feelings in order to be a convincing king. The next example the professor uses is the role of Hamlet. He mentions that Hamlet is a complicated role since he is seeing ghosts and pretending to be insane. The professor insists that the actor must actually become Hamlet by feeling the things he feels and thinking the thoughts he thinks. Unit 36 Writing Listening Listen to a lecture and take notes. Before we get started on today's writing assignment, 
I want to go over a couple of literary conventions I believe you'll find to be rather effective in enhancing the overall, uh, quality of your work when writing both short stories and novels. Ironically, these two literary conventions are opposites. I'm referring, of course, to exaggeration and its opposite, understatement. Let's look at exaggeration first. It's something we've all used. Exaggeration is simply overstating something. It's saying that something is greater than what it is in reality. Why don't I give you some examples? Have you ever been really hungry? Sure, everyone has. Well, one exaggeration would be to say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Of course, you couldn't really do that, but you're exaggerating to get your point across. You might also say, that was the greatest play I've ever seen, to compliment your actor friend. It probably wasn't. You're just, well, overstating, but he'll appreciate the compliment. Now for understatement. What's that? Well, it's merely saying that something is less than what it is in reality. Often, in fact, your understatement may appear to be negative when you're actually praising or complimenting someone. Here's an example. Have you ever tasted something that was quite delicious, but when the person asked how it was, you said, not bad? This would typically indicate that the quality is low, but in this case, you're using understatement, so you really mean it's delicious. Also, after getting an A on a test, you might understate your performance and merely say, okay, when someone asks how you did. All right, now let's see if we can use them in our writing. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. During the lecture, the professor tells the students about a couple of literary conventions that they can use to improve their creative writing ability. These two conventions are exaggeration and understatement. The professor also mentions that they are opposites. First, exaggeration is saying that something is greater than it really is. Some people might say they could eat a horse when they are hungry, or that something was the greatest thing they have ever seen. In both cases, they are overstating the ways that they feel. Understatement, on the other hand, is saying that something is less than it is in reality. Two examples of this are saying something is not bad when it is really delicious, and saying that a grade of A on a test or paper is just okay. Unit 37 Botany Listening Listen to a lecture and take notes. Let's move on to something different. As you are no doubt aware, nature always strives to keep everything in balance. This includes both plants and animals. By keeping a perfect balance, no one species can take over and upset the stability of an environment. However, there are some invasive species that do exactly this. The acacia is one such invader. Acacias are a family of trees and shrubs most of which are native to Australia. However, some of them have found their way to other countries, where they often dramatically upset the balance of nature. How? Well, there are uh, two separate ways. First is the fact that acacia's roots are not only strong, but are also extensive. So they, well, dig deep into the soil and stretch in all directions. Imagine hundreds of hands stretching in every possible direction. Interesting, huh? What this does is it lets the acacia's roots absorb all of the soil's nutrients. This, in turn, starves the other trees nearby, causing them to die from a lack of nutrients. I can explain the second way acacias harm other species by telling you about the tree called the Australian blackwood, which is a typical member of the acacia family. It can grow to be almost 150 feet in height. Why, you may ask, is this important? Well. The leaves of the acacia help to prevent sunlight from ever reaching the ground. This, in turn, causes many smaller plants and trees to die because they don't get exposed to enough sunlight. Unsurprisingly, much effort is currently being put into keeping the acacia out of forests where it is not native. Compare Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. 
The professor's lecture mentions that invasive species often disrupt the balance of nature by changing the environment. He cites the acacia family of trees as one example. To begin with, the professor mentions the extensive root system of these trees. He states that they are very far-reaching and that they tend to absorb a lot of nutrients from the ground. In fact, they absorb so many nutrients that other plants and trees nearby don't get enough, which causes them to die. He also describes the Australian blackwood, a member of the acacia family. It can be over 150 feet high. Because of this, it has a lot of leaves, which block sunlight from reaching shorter trees and plants near the ground. Since they don't receive any sunlight, they eventually wind up dying. Unit 38. Education. Listening. Listen to a lecture and take notes. Parents often have to resort to giving rewards to their children to entice them to do various actions. We've already discussed the psychological reasoning behind this. However, strangely enough, there are actually a couple of different reactions by children when they are rewarded. It basically depends upon the child's attitude toward the action for which he is being rewarded. The results may actually uh, surprise you. For example, let's consider a young girl who really hates cleaning her room. Out of all of her chores, that's the one she dislikes the most and often refuses to do. As a result of this, her parents finally tell her that they'll give her a reward, like uh, maybe take her out to her favorite pizza restaurant. The little girl, excited by the prospect of having pizza for dinner, reacts positively and immediately heads to her room to clean it up. That's an example of how rewards can work, you know, positively. However, let's imagine another little girl the same age as the first one. She is learning the piano and, in fact, absolutely adores playing it. Her parents are really excited about her positive attitude, so they decide to reward her by taking her out to her favorite restaurant. Unfortunately, since they only go there after piano practice, the little girl begins to feel that playing the piano is an obligation and not something fun to do. Over time, she becomes less enamored of playing and eventually quits. In this case, we can clearly see how her being rewarded for something she already enjoyed had a negative effect on her. Compare Listen to a sample response and compare it with yours. The professor says that children react differently to rewards depending upon the reason they are getting them. In his first example, he mentions a little girl who hates cleaning her room. Her parents convince her to do so by offering her a reward. They will take her out to her favorite pizza restaurant. The girl reacts positively and goes to clean her room in anticipation of getting to eat pizza. The second example is about a girl who enjoys playing the piano. However, her parents mistakenly start rewarding her after piano practice by treating her to pizza. Because that's the only time she ever eats it, playing the piano becomes a burden, so she starts to dislike playing it and eventually quits. This is an example of a reward with a negative result. Unit 39 Earth Science Listening Listen to a lecture and take notes. Okay, so that concludes my lecture on dinosaurs and their natural habitats. Now, let's move to one of Earth's greatest mysteries. It is, of course, what caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. After all, these were enormous creatures, much larger than anything living now. They were so strong and lived everywhere. So. What made them suddenly die? There are a couple of major theories on dinosaur extinction. Let me expand upon them for you. The first is that there was a large meteor or asteroid that hit Earth. Some scientists have even, in their opinions, pinpointed the exact places where these celestial objects struck the planet. Anyway, what happened, they say, is that after the strike, Lots of dirt and debris were thrown into the atmosphere. There was so much dust that it actually blocked the sun. This cooled the planet, 
and with a lack of sunlight cause most plant life to die. The herbivorous dinosaurs, unable to eat, first died, and then the carnivorous ones followed them down the path to extinction. The second theory is that a supervolcano, that is one hundreds of times more powerful more than, than the, the Tepe explosion, erupted and filled the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. This caused a rapid onset of the greenhouse effect. So why would this kill the dinosaurs, which were essentially jelly giant reptiles and should like hot weather? Well, reptile eggs are very vulnerable and sensitive to heat. One thing that often happens in extreme heat is that the sex of the unborn reptile changes from female to male. There was a proliferation of males which couldn't reproduce. Over time, the dinosaurs all quickly died out because of this. This. Compare. Listen to a sample response and compare it and compare it. Scores. The professor states, states that the dinosaurs ruled ruled her, but suddenly became extinct. She gives two different the different things plus to explain appearance. The f the first is that a meteor or asteroids Earth struck Earth. She even says that some scientists and know some where it hit hit. The strikes and dirt sent into the atmosphere which hid the planet from its sun. It got colder, and there was no sunlight, so all no sunlight plant died. Without food sources, the dinosaurs all died. The second theory is that there was an, eru an eru eruption of volcano. No, this filled the air with carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide which ca which caused its effect to start off to sun Earth. When subjected to heat, lizard, digestive, or eggs change, males become males. Males. So there were more females being born, which meant that the dinosaurs couldn't reproduce.